right, welcome back to Black Bolt Podcast. Today we're here with Courtney Hawley, who is a performance artist, a dancer, and little known, she's also a pilot. Hello. Wait, you're a pilot? She yep. is a pilot. You said that when I wasn't I wasn't listening or something? Nope. No. Nope. But she brought up uh, oh. how she's used to the mic. Um, because she talks oh. on the radio, and I was like, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. They put it like almost in their mouth. Yeah. I've yeah. seen it happen. It's very right. really yeah. bizarre. Yeah. Well, you have all the background noise from the plane, and so you don't want that interfering with the mic. So you got to get really up into it to yeah. get over the squelch. Yeah. Yep. So are you like trying to be some sort of a pilot? Like, a what kind of pilot are you trying to do? I haven't decided yet. I could do uh, flight training, like CFI, certified flight instructor, or go into survey. Or just end up in Alaska, you know, transporting wow. stuff to places. What have been Not your sure. best experiences flying? Um, easily just like the random trips doing, going out to places with friends. So like last summer, I went out to Summer Lake with my neighbor, flew into a tiny little strip, hiked four miles, sat in some hot springs all night, and then flew out in the morning. Wow. That's a fun little fact about you. Yep. So let's go into a little bit about your background with dancing, performance art, and kind of how you got to where you are right now. Yeah. Well, I started out doing drill team uh, back in Southern Utah and uh, then transitioned up to here to Portland uh, where I went to Arts and Communications Magnet Academy. Mm -hmm. I was there for two years and kind of got introduced to the more classic dance styles, ballet, jazz, modern Um Yep. And then after that, went on a totally different route. I decided to travel for a bit. Then I went and got an engineering degree. And during that time, I taught myself to hula hoop, which is how I got on with March 4th. Um, and through them, learned more hula hooping, stilt walking, and uh, aerial arts and that kind of thing. And can you tell us what March 4th is real quick? March 4th is... Uh, has many, many different people involved in the project throughout the years. They're, they're 15 years old. It's a marching band that um, focuses on um, jazz, funk, rock, just all kinds of fun. It's a huge spectacle. They've got 13 people on stage plus four dancers, people doing insane tricks on stilts and different acrobatics, hand balancing, and it's just kind of a raucous party wherever they go. Yeah, Ben sent me one of the videos, and I believe that's March 4th, because there was a guy on stilt, and then you hopped on, you guys were, like, twirling each other around, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, obviously is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, like, where does one <laughs> even really start in planning some of those choreographed moves? Because you're all over the place. Yeah, well, they've been doing... So the the routine that you guys saw was the pole routine. So it's a guy on stilts, three foot stilts. So he's standing about nine feet tall and he's got um, probably a nine foot pole, like a big metal pole. And we're doing a pole dance routine on that pole, including um, other acrobatics like splits or flips over the top of them and that sort of thing. And so it's basically just all R&D uh, research and development in our little studios. We get all the equipment on, mm -hmm. we jump up there and just kind of see what works. And if it doesn't work, there's mats to land on. Right, I was just about to ask about that. Like, how, when you fall, like, how do you test out new moves? Do you have, like, a foam pit? I mean, what do you do with that? If it's new enough, we'll put it in one of the gymnastics studios around mm -hmm. here. But otherwise, we just kind of trust the bases. They've been doing it for so long, and they're really sturdy and capable, and nobody's doing anything too crazy, at least from, like, our perspective. It looks insane, like, from, like, the civilian, you know, somebody that's never done that kind of thing. But for us, it's all pretty standard what would you say is the toughest thing to overcome when you're first trying out these tricks is it like strength or like the mental capacity to just hurl yourself out there I mean, what, what's the toughest part uh it's to know what kind of forces you're putting on your base so the base is the person who's lifting the flyer and to understand if I kick in a certain way or if I drop in a certain way, I'm shifting his weight around and he's only standing on pegs. He can't stand still. He must keep walking. So for you to like jolt him in a certain way is really like we'll throw the whole trick off. Hmm. So that's the hardest thing is like realizing that it's not just you chucking yourself around. You're also pushing somebody else around as well. well and you're relying on them. So yes. that's gotta be gotta Your be a little scary. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Which part which position do you think is, is scarier? Oh, easily the flyer. Okay, yeah. yeah. Which do you think is yeah. harder? Um it's it's hard in different ways. Like the flyer right. needs to stay really tight. 
And it's really difficult to try to not save yourself because a lot of it can be like if you go into a freak out moment, you're going to like collapse and like try to grab onto your base. But the best thing to do is just to keep your shape, be rigid and predictable is what they tell us so that when something's going wrong, the base can grab a predictable shape rather than somebody that's like cat flailing out there. So don't try to land on your own. You have high, have hope in your, what'd you call it? The the base. The base yep. to actually protect you in a way. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So you're strong as hell. Like, how important is that? Because I, I don't want to call people out, which I'm not going to, but I've seen like a lot of times you perform with other people and you're the only stable one up there. And I'm wondering, is that strength? Is that like, what quality is that? Um, yeah, there's some definite strength there, like just to like do certain moves where you're doing like a pull up onto somebody, you needed to be able to do a pull up on your own. So that definitely helps. Um, otherwise you're just managing your momentum and staying, staying really tight. So you can be, you don't have to be that strong because the bases Mm. are really strong. Mm. One of you has to do it. But if you're not that strong, you need to be able to manage your momentum and also just keep it in, like not have those wobbles. And like, even if you're not strong, like your legs or your arms, your core has to be really strong and put together. What kind of exercises do you do on your own time to make sure that that is something that you have down? Mm, I'll condition... A couple days a week, just like sit-ups, push-ups, regular stuff. Um, And then I go to gymnastics a couple times a week, and I'm a rock climber. So the rock climbing really helps with like core stabilization and then just all the arm and everything. Core stabilization is huge. I mean, we can go into a long rant about physical health and training. I know. I li- uh, I was happy to in- yeah. <laughs> invite her on here because you guys are like two of the strongest people I know. Two of the most in shape. So I was yeah. like, that was like, yeah, they'll, they'll they'll connect on that. I, I have a question that's not health related though. Um, in your journey, because you were an engineer, like you got an engineering degree. At what point did you realize that's not for me? Because that seems like a pretty promising future, at least monetarily. Right. Why did you turn away from that? I. Right out of school, I didn't really have anything lined up, actually. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do with my degree, which is something you ought to do as an undergraduate, is having those internships nailed down and you're moving right into the workforce. But I didn't have that. So I was throwing out resumes all over the place and um, started my pilot's license and about two weeks later got hired with an aerial surveying firm. And so I was on with them for two years. And that was amazing. So I kind of, you know, used like some things that I learned in school through that. But basically, uh, it was just the job that I got. It was just yeah. kind of what landed in my lap. And so I did that for two years. And uh, the schedule was kind of difficult. You know, it's two weeks on, two weeks off. But two weeks is like full on in the fields. You're living mm-hmm. at a hotel rooms and the lifestyle gets uh, exhausting. So did that for two years and then joined the circus. Yeah, you call it the circus. Yeah. <laughs> How does one, as a as a performance artist, go about promoting themselves for opportunities like this? Ooh, um, it's usually just word of mouth in Portland. Yeah, you don't have to do a whole lot of like, here I am. This is what I do. It's more like, oh, this person has a space has space open for this type of act. Who do we know that can do it? So there's not a yeah. whole lot of like broadcasting yourself out there you more just hear about gigs or they hear about you and contact you it's it's much more close circle but how do they how do you get to that point because we always promote a lot of you know content generation or like boost your social um and of course networking just in general but it seems like that industry is it's all over the place but you don't always see the people like walking on the streets you can't point them out so like how do you meet them how do we meet? Yeah, like other how do you how do you network? Or? Yeah, like within circus circles, circus circles, circus circles. <laughs> um, I just just word of mouth can't even yeah tell you any more than that. It's wow. you just hear about a gig, or uh, I guess you know there's some places where you can go and kind of showcase what you do. There's like event, um, there's like an event conven- convention. And you can go there and like be oh, like, this okay. is what we do. So you can have like partner acrobatics showcased at your event. 
and you'd be like, oh, great, we'll pay you $500 an hour and you guys can come here and throw a few tricks and wow our guests and then go home. Wow. So you don't just run up to people on the street and say, hey, look at me and do yeah, backflips. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, but I bet that Not sometimes, quite. you know, like on, you go to first Thursday or something or last yeah. Thursday mm-hmm. and they have some people who are doing – some not as dangerous acrobatic stuff, but they're twirling each other around and doing flips. And that could be a start just as a street performer. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about it a little bit, trying to get what we call like corporate gigs. So those are the ones where they have, um, they already have the event set up. They have like a theme. They just need people to fill in those slots. And so how do we get those gigs? And we're still trying to like explore those avenues a little bit more because how do you reach out to either the event coordinator or the event space to um, promote yourself and put yourself out there. So we've come up with a few different things, just like little promo videos or even doing live demonstrations for them. But we have other things to work on too. And it takes a lot of time and energy to create the business side of it when what we actually want to do is the tricks you know, yeah. you can spend so many hours like sitting in front of your computer and sending emails about what you do, but really you just want to do the backflips. I feel like there's a huge opportunity for actual doing videos like you just said. And a lot of them, they could go viral in a way if they're done right. Yeah. And that could be just a mass exposure outlet, just like an opportunity right there in itself. Right. Yeah. 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 Cause you guys do so much cool stuff and it's all visual. And even though like, obviously if you're there in person, it's, 10 times better. Right. right. But, and there's not a lot of arts like that. It's like that and like plays and a couple of mm. other performance, like but get performance art in general is usually a little bit more of a, it's going to have a much bigger impact in person than on video, as opposed to most of the stuff we usually talk about and deal with, which is all done on a computer or it's film or whatever. Yeah. But um, I mean, let's think about like, what if, cause like you and I, we always come up with these ideas out of nowhere and they're funny ideas. And then imagine if you collaborated with, someone like her and had this silly script and then as person come in as a costume as some sort of like a character then suddenly these like animations we used to make could in a way come to life yeah mm-hmm. if we had professionals doing professional stuff yeah, yeah. that'd be super <laughs> cool yeah for sure yeah, just yeah. an idea yeah, yeah. no I, I think yeah crossing stuff's cool uh, but my point is just that um, it, it can be tough to promote stuff that is better in person but still the stuff you guys do some of it is so amazing that it's still it's gonna grab people if they see it visually and be like, oh yeah. dang. Like that's really gonna grab them more than anything else because that's that's what it is. It's it's you guys doing amazing physical stuff. And it's kind of hard to capture that in any other way other than actually seeing it. hmm mm-hmm. Yeah. And being like, oh damn, I wanna go watch that. So is, would you say like your end goal is to be like straight up Cirque du Soleil stuff, or what is your end goal with it? No, it's more it's all just for fun. Honestly, for me, people like try to create, you know, like <clears throat> they want to get really big and famous and, you know, take this mm-hmm. everywhere. So it'd be fun to travel with it. It'd be fun to um, just, you know, baseline, like be able to do that as my main source of income would be awesome. Um, but that's really hard to do in this world. The risk, too. I mean, that's like being a professional athlete. You see right. anyone yeah. who's in doing sports, especially football players, once they yeah. fall, break their leg, then their con- contract is not going to be renewed next yeah. time. Yeah, that's why I'm falling back on flying. Flying school, though. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's, I mean, that's just as intense. It's another adrenaline rush, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, I like uh things that where you're just fully engaged and doing anything else is like not an option for you in that moment like acrobatics you need to be on point communicating with your partner you've got like your little like script running through your head of exactly what you're doing and the same with flying you're always right there in the moment you have to be on point and thinking of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing (laughs) i think it's i think it's great to be (laughs) enthralled like i think that's something everyone should should strive for is having something in their life that like completely pulls them out of everything else and they're Mm -hmm. just doing just that Mm -hmm. because I I think it's a good lesson to learn just to kind of be able to like fully transform into the moment and and embrace it and it and it helps with everything helps with no matter what your job is or what task you're doing if you're able to give your full attention to it I just just this morning decided to put my phone on airplane mode all morning at the best morning (laughs) ever Mm -hmm. just the most focused like I got so much stuff done I was just like whoa I gotta start doing this every day I couldn't believe how much stuff I got done and it's just from taking away distractions and so it's cool to have 
things that you even with the art that we do and even with uh like making videos or yeah uh, the best way yeah. is to really shut everything off i get really distracted by what everyone else gets distracted yeah. by you know yeah. facebook yeah. or like i put an instagram post up so i look over and see like oh a like a like a like you know just it's something mm-hmm. just yelling at you this whole yeah. time but you gotta be able to shut it off we promote this a lot how you just gotta focus on your mental health in general like that because i think that's so distracting you almost get this, this add amplified when you're just like oh let me look at that let me look at that let me work on this and you just kind of go in this weird vicious circle and you never really get much done because you're multitasking low-key the whole time Mm -hmm. so i mean what what do you do to kind of tune yourself out or to escape that a lot of people work out um a lot of people read a book i mean what do you do yeah um i don't the things that i do just don't lend themselves to distraction while i'm doing them so like I feel like it's the combination of mental and physical focus. Like your your entire body is engaged in what you're doing. Plus you're also problem solving or mitigating risk or whatever you're doing mentally so that both of those aspects combined, you just don't have more to give. There, right. there is no more like distraction available to you. You just can't focus on that many things at once. So, mm-hmm. Do you, um, so we talk about mental health Every, like like Alex was saying, every time yeah. uh, we have an episode. And do you focus on your mental health outside of these activities and and kind of check in and say, how am I doing and how is this affecting my work? My because for because that when you're doing something that's that like high risk, I feel like your 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 mental state is almost more important than it would be for other low risk thing, you know? Yeah. Because like, if you if you're not there mentally, you could hurt yourself or someone else. Right. Yeah. We do. Absolutely take it easy if somebody's not having a good day and we're always checking in with each other about how the other person's feeling emotionally, like outside of acro, especially acro, like you and your partner will always be like, this is where I'm at today. This is how I'm feeling. This is what happened to me. And because that translates directly into your connection with that person. And I mean, and on the other side of it, if you're just like gung ho about it and getting crazy, it can Sometimes yeah. even be more intense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you need to have that like very pinpoint of connection with the other person that that is unwavering to really throw hard tricks. I think it's like just losing focus in any way. You lose focus when you get too excited. You lose focus when you get fatigued. Yeah. And like you said, that's a huge like a liability issue. Mm-hmm. You don't want to throw someone and then just miscalculate one little thing <laughs> and then they break their arm. Right. Everyone's dead. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a great thing to bring up because this is actually true for for any project that you're working on with with more than more than just yourself. Totally, it's All not designers, just for dance. Especially. Yeah, yeah. Like you end up having to collaborate more than you think you do, and then when you have to collaborate, you actually have to have like a connection with the people that you're collaborating with, and make sure that it's a healthy connection. Yeah, that you understand each other, that you're respecting each other, that you're listening to each other, and like no one talks about this stuff. You don't learn this in school. They're not like, mm-hmm. okay, if you're on a project, it's only going to work if everyone gets along and listens to each other and checks in with each other. It's like they don't tell you that, but it ends up being a huge thing. And a, and a lot of successful groups kind of stick together because they're like, oh, I already know this guy. I already know he does good work. I already know he's going to listen to me. And it, the dance thing's cool because that w- with that, that's so prominent. Um, but it's I think it's less obvious in, in other mediums. Let's play the other side on that too. When you grow up and you do a lot of group projects, per se, maybe they're teaching you to not work with people who you effing hate. You know what yes. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, God, that was a disaster. I yeah. hated all those people. and They just made me do everything. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. like, I got to work with people who I trust. Yeah. And that was miserable, and I don't want life to feel like this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. I, I think that's a learning experience for everyone. I, that's the one thing about riskier careers is you're forced to accept that more. Whereas if you take a safer career where you got a like a cushy job and you have like a cubicle and stuff, and you're like, well, all I have to do is show up. And it's like, well, but you have to report to someone and there's people working next to you. And if they're all the worst and you're just miserable every day, but you're like, well, I worked really hard to get in this really specialized job that I have now. And I don't, and it's going to be a pain in the ass to go to another company and stuff like that. That'll slowly creep up on you. And then kind of wear you down. Yes. Whereas when you're working in something more high risk, like art or dance, any of that stuff, you actually have to, you're constantly checking in about that. Cause you're like, look, I'm already taking a huge risk. This doesn't seem to be working out. I, you kind of immediately can tell that the long term's not going to be good. Mm-hmm. And you're like, especially if you're, you're paying attention to it and not just being like too happy go lucky or go gung ho about it. You know, mm-hmm. have you ever gotten really excited about an idea and like sent it off 
And then look at it a few hours later and like, oh my God, why did I send that? Oh, a like billion that? times. <laughs> a like, billion that's, that's times. Not good. A million times. We've both done that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, yeah. How much, how much of the choreography do you actually come up with yourself? Um, quite a bit. So I'm in a couple different groups. Um, there's a company called Tempos Contemporary Circus. And for that one, each group or like duet or, um, uh, individual comes up with pretty much all their own choreography, a little bit of input from our director. Uh, yeah. So I've got to choreograph a few different duets and group pieces for that group. March 4th. What's that like? like? I'm sorry to interrupt. Wait, yeah, what, no. is it, what do you start with that? Choreography? Yeah. Choreography is weird. It seems weird. Like, it's it's like, just so like out of my circle. I, I just want to know about I, it. I'm just getting used to it. Like I've, I've been a dancer for so long, but I've always just had pieces set on me. Like somebody else has the idea and the type of motion and um, the emotion that's going with it. And you just do that and try to like bring that to life. Um, but then to come up with it is so arbitrary. You're like, okay, we're going to like put our arm this way and then we're going to slice it across. And then we're going to like, <laughs> and you're just, you're just standing in a room with another person. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, let's do that 20 times or whatever <laughs> it is. It's just, it feels stupid and ridiculous. And then you put it on stage and it seems like, oh, of course that's what we were supposed to do. And it's <laughs> like, it's a dance and it all comes together. But in the moment of like, you need to move parts of your body in a way to counts. And then remember those things yeah. is really awkward and just, it's, it's funny. And it's fun to see other people that are, people that are good at choreography just move. Like, you know, they're, they're drawing on such a huge history of, of training that they just have these like little things that they get to do and they just stick them all together in ways that they find entertaining. This seems almost like somebody who like, I'm going to, this is going to sound like completely out of left field rap battles. Yeah, some yeah. people are good at it. Some totally. people are not. But some people just kind of have moves in their head that they spit out mm -hmm. and they kind of make it mm -hmm. seem like they know what they're doing. But mm -hmm. really, they just kind of pulled that from something else. Yeah. That's a good That's a good analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what just pops up in my head when I hear that. Yeah. I don't know. But like, how do you identify if it's wrong? Like you're, you're doing it and you're in the moment and you're still kind of conceptualizing these moves. And but you haven't had someone tell you what's wrong. How do you know mm. it's wrong? I don't know that it would be. Yeah, no, it can be wrong because it just like they won't flow together. It's like painting. It's like using acrylic and then chalk and then you know like it's using different mediums together. But in dance, like it'll be different feelings or like ways of movement that just something will feel disjointed or it'll stop in one place and you can see that the phrase kind of ended and they're like oh tacking on things to the end so it's mostly the outside eye or things that feel awkward in your own body that you just physically you'll feel yeah, it yeah it won't be right right isn't a lot of choreography like isn't a lot of it taking from other choreography just like kind of every other art right you know like you I see stuff so. and that's what gives you ideas because it is it's so arbitrary you got to start somewhere i guess you yeah. could kind of feel it out but like how, and I actually don't know this, how often are choreographers dancers? Like always or? I would say always. Okay. Just because they need to know what you're doing. Yeah. What they're working with. I mean, it's like how often are composers musicians? Right. Well, some, some of them, some of them don't, it's, but it's rare. But some of them like, like Eric Whitaker is not really a musician. He's like the most famous mm -hmm. contemporary composer right now. I, I, he was a musician, but like, not like that. Like he went to Juilliard and was like, wow, I, I can't. I can't, I can't do anything you guys are doing. So he just wrote, you right. know, so there, there, there's a huge disconnect for that. But that's, again, that's a little different because you're kind of like, well, I'm right. You, you already know the rules. People, right. you know, the rules, people say, yeah. this is what people can do. This is what the experts can do. This is what the beginners can do. Yeah. Go for it. Right. Yeah. Right. Something to fit that. So, yeah. But and yeah. knowing what style you're working in too is really important for, just for your own framework and like your own inspiration. If you know, like I'm choreographing either like, a storyline or if it's in a specific style of dance or the, like the music is giving you the inspiration for the style of movement. That's, that's pretty much where you draw it from. I'd say. Okay. I, we went, we went into music for a second and I yeah. thought about, you know, you always hear on the news, Oh, Bruno Mars stole someone's music again. Does that ever happen in performance art? Or, Stealing movement. Yeah. Like, can you claim that? I don't think so. In, in acrobatics. Yes. People will like claim movement, 
Like if they are working a trick that they don't think anybody else has done, they'll like, even in our group, we won't post things online right. until we have done them in oh. our own performance. That explains a lot. The lack of videos. Yeah. Because it's like, you guys are doing this so often and it's so visually appealing. Like why are there more, or aren't there more people pulling their phone out right. and being like, sweet, you know, and posting it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. We do post like a few things, but, uh, Usually only after we've done the performance and we keep all our like big tricks on lock. Which, right. I mean, people are doing bigger stuff everywhere else in the world. It's just with our own little circles that they want like ownership of the choreography that they've created. Yeah, because it's so easy to steal them and no one's going to yeah. do anything. Right. We don't think about that for a ton of performance things because the comedy world's actually this, the same from what I hear. Like comedians all do these jokes and it's like they're performing them every night, but you cannot take someone else's joke right. and perform your, you know, that's just like right. a, a huge no, no. Yeah. You know, Carlos Mencia is gone now because yeah. Joe Rogan called him out. It was like, or like a couple of people mm-hmm. were just like, what are you doing, man? Like, mm. so, so that's interesting. Cause I never thought of it. Like I never thought of it like that really for comedy, first of all, but I never thought of it like that for dance either. But uh, yeah, probably if, you know, do you guys have like a business manager or just like, do you have like someone who is in charge of the business or is it just like everyone's kind of trying to help and, and, it's only getting so far. Uh, March 4th does, of course. Like we have right, yeah. tour managers and people doing the booking and all of that. Well, some people make a living off that, right? Yeah. Okay. And 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 you worked with them. So you've never been with them. Full, you were with them full time sometimes, right? You tour around the country with them, right? So, right? I have been on tour with March 4th before. And okay. I just do like random one-off gigs with them every once in a while. Like was down in Tahoe with them. Southern California, Arizona. Uh, but yeah, I've been like across the country to Florida with them before. Yeah. All on the big tour bus. Yeah, I come, yeah. I'm really curious about the business structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what so, do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, so kind of run us through, like, yeah, there's a manager. Is there a social person? Is there like these, all these little production assistants? I mean, how does this really work? Yeah. They've tried to bring on more people recently because they have this idea about being able to land bigger gigs if they have the right people to connect with. So really there's um, a few people who are like from the original, the band's 15 years old um, and there's four or five people still connected to the band really intensely that are now like the artistic director, um, the tour manager, social media, like outreach someone doing all the finances and making sure everybody gets paid and that is all going on. And there's also, I don't remember like the name of the role, but the one that's doing like the booking agent. Right. Mm. And that's the one that we March 4th usually does internally. And then like in the past couple of years, they've tried to like reach out a lot more and been like, okay, who can we bring on? That's like the professional that can market us and get land us those huge gigs. Do you reach so, out to agencies? Personally, no. They don't. No. But does does March fourth reach out agencies, to agencies like 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 marketing agencies, ad agencies? Mm, I don't think so. I think they, no. I think they have to. Some of the bigger ones should because, right? I mean, like, I'm not sure. I don't know how that works. Really, I don't know how they book gigs. Do they just call the venue and say, "Hey, what's up?" And yeah, I don't know how that that whole side of it well, works. I don't know if they'd call the venue, but they would at least come up with all the designs. Mm. That then you would push out. Yeah. Yeah. They just make the design. Somebody's doing that, but I'm not sure who it is. I just spin the hula hoops. They have, so March 4th has their birthday show on March 4th, right? Mm. That's right. Which is just this a weekend. few days from oh, now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So where is that? That's going to be at the Crystal Ballroom, just like every year on their wonderful sprung floors. So it's going to be March 3rd, that Saturday night. Uh, March 4th, we're going to have a matinee and then our 15th spectacular anniversary will be that evening. Oh, so they, they perform there be, because they use the floors? Uh, no, we just like it. It's oh, fun. yeah. It's no, like, I, lo- just, I like it too. I yeah. love it. Yeah, that's my favorite place to go for shows, for sure. That's Wait, really cool. Why? Crystal Ball, because the floor ha- it has springs under it. I know it moves, but like, that's intentional? Yes. The, the, the floor of the Crystal Ballroom? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's intentional. It's for impact. I always felt like it was moving, and we were all a little nervous about that. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, they also have some of the best sound in the city. From, think from so? some, yeah, it's, definitely. Yeah, from, but uh-huh. here's the thing: I haven't been there in a few years, and I so I, I know a lot of places have improved 
since I've been around going to the, all the venues and listening to stuff. So maybe not anymore, but they've been, they've been one of the more consistent uh, venues for yeah. sure. So I usually, I uh, like enough so that people be like, so-and-so's playing. I'd be like, where? And if they said Roseland, I'm not going. If they said Crystal Ballroom, I'm going. Hmm. Like, so it, uh, it, it can make a bit, pretty big difference. Mm. I saw Ratatat there and that springy floor was just like, yeah, that's what we need right now. Yeah. Really? Everyone's just jumping up and down and yeah. Yeah, for, I mean it was. I mean it was like packed, like wall to wall, like you couldn't yeah. move. So it was kind of nice to at least be able to move up and down. I, like, had no, <laughs> I had no idea this was intentional. The floor thing. I'm pretty sure because it, what because if you're wrong and it is sketchy and we're all gonna fall through it? <laughs> you just don't want to be in Lola's room when that right? happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, start playing. I created pool. this podcast so I can just make shit up and say it. That's <laughs> no, but for real, we should look that up at the end of this. Post it, get posted on the end. Yeah, we but, should. Uh, yeah. Um, I, do you have any like advice for performance artists or anyone who's trying to break into that scene? That's um, no, I'd say I'm um, just keep doing what you're doing if you're passionate about it. Like, I didn't know why I was practicing hula hoop for for hour, you know, like for all these hours a week, or why I was doing hand to hand balancing with people. Like, why do I want to do that so badly? Um, you just keep doing it and practicing it and then something will come up for you because other people out there are doing it and there are just avenues for you to put that on stage or to tour with it or whatever you want to do with it. Yeah. Good. Don't question yourself too much. Just keep going. I like that. Yeah. You got any upcoming shows other than March 4th or is that it? Yeah, March 4th is on March 4th and then Tempo's Contemporary Circus is going to have their annual show May 4th, 5th, and 6th at uh, the AWOL Dance Collective which we're really excited about. We're going to throw some big tricks down for that. And Sweet. yeah. Nice. Cool. Well, thank you for coming on, Courtney. We yeah, really enjoyed having you. Yeah. Yeah. I really wish you the best of luck with March 4th and hopefully, you know, everything goes well for you, especially with the plane stuff. Gosh. Cheers. Yep. I yeah. hope it goes well too. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Nice right. to have you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.